Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot. Those are my business cards. Jeff and I already so I it out. You guys have to know me and Lisa when I was old last night, right? I, I, I guess I didn't. Did you wonder? I didn't look at it. Weren't you jealous of our hey, cool Jeffrey, hat. we're going to have to do this all over again. You know, in two years now, we got all this stuff. <laughs> exactly. It's <laughs> nice. All set still. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to call to order the Middleton Committee of the Whole. Um, do um, we have a roll call, please? Yes. Here. 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 Focuses on. Perfect. All right, our first discussion item for the Committee of the Whole is the presentation on parliamentary procedure from Dan Foth, adjunct instructor from the UW Extension. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, I have uh, fond uh, feelings for the city of Middleton. Brian is uh, not only one of our instructors for our certified uh, public manager program, but also sits on our advisory council and we appreciate his service. Uh, and I am a member of the Pleasant View Golf Club, which I uh, we used to play at University Ridge and was too hard to get a tee time. We started playing Pleasant View and actually liked it better. So, um, <laughs> oh, Kendra's very excited on that one. <laughs> oh, okay, trucks, trucks don't bother you when you're playing. Um, let me just test this, make sure this is working. It is. Uh, and as you can tell, my title is local government specialist and I'm also director of the CPM program. Uh, and if I'm a little uncomfortable sitting here, normally I like to wander around when I speak, but, um, and the last time I spoke like this was to a, uh, Senate investigatory panel on railroad safety, uh, because I used to work at, at the American Public Transportation Association. I ran the commuter railroad group and about 15 years ago, maybe 20 now, there was a ter couple terrible commuter rail accidents in the span of a week. And so that became a crisis in Washington, like only accidents can become. So I do welcome you to walk around if you feel free. Oh yeah, but then I have to hold the mic and then I have to look at this. <laughs> Fair enough. I told Brian, I didn't think I could do all that at the same time. So <laughs> let's get started. So uh, this is a somewhat cynical view on meetings, but I liked it. So I put it in the pre presentation. Meetings are indispensable when you don't want to do anything. So we're gonna talk a little bit about meeting and a lot about meeting uh, procedures and Robert rules of order. But I thought it was useful to first define what a meeting is, which under the state statutes, a meeting is a gathering of members of a governmental body for purposes of exercising its responsibilities. So that's your committees, that's your task forces that the, the city sets up, obviously the common council, um, any group that the city sets up, uh, regardless of whether it's populated by alders or the mayor or the president, uh, if it's all citizen members, they're still subject to the open meetings law and they're still considered in, in a meeting when they're having meetings. So let's talk a little bit about meeting rules. Uh, the statutes uh, have very few meeting rules. Uh, basically they define a quorum, motion, seconding and voting. And the voting is basically, uh, if you do a voice vote and someone asks for a roll call, then you must do a roll call vote. And you have some rules. Chapter one of the common council meetings. If you haven't familiarized yourself with those, you should. They're uh, fairly sh uh, short and to the point, which is, uh, which is not bad. Um, and they reference Robert Rules of Order, the current edition, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, as your meeting procedures. Oops, got two. Okay, so your meeting rules, uh, you, you have a quorum requirement of two thirds membership of the common council. Um, you also have some general rules. Uh, your proceedings will be covered by the parliamentary rules set forth in Robert's Rules of Order from time to time is revised. And it's great you have from time to time is revised because some places just go with the current edition number 
And when a new edition comes out, which it does every 10 years, uh, they're immediately outdated. Uh, you have citizen participation uh, approach, but it's pretty short and to the point. Um, and then you have, uh, and this is a little different from Roberts and I'll mention it uh, when we talk about it later, but your motions uh, can be amended or withdrawn without consent of an older person, or you cannot amend or withdraw a motion without the consent of an older person making the same and the older person seconding it. And that's a little different from what Roberts requires. So since you're under Robert's rules of order, let's talk a little bit about what the purpose of Robert's is. It's to facilitate this discussion, not obstruct it. It is, is it meant to provide justice and courtesy to all. Each proposition is entitled to a full and free, and Robert uses the word debate, but I like the word discussion because discussion implies back and forth, coming to a good decision. Mm -hmm. And to me, debate implies winners and losers because in debates, you either win or you lose. Mm -hmm. um, it's intended to be fair to all, although there's a lot of commentators that feel Roberts is used sometimes uh, to bludgeon people who don't understand how Roberts works. Mm -hmm. And my experience is most people that say Roberts works a certain way don't really understand themselves how Roberts work. But it's also intended to provide order. In other words, the majority decides, the majority rules, and to provide some stability. So Roberts, the 12th edition, which came out a couple of years ago, is this big, thick book. If you have a copy, great. It's written in very arcane language. Uh, there's lots of it that makes almost absolutely no sense. So I strongly recommend that you get this little book which was written by the same people that wrote Roberts and it's called Roberts Rules of Order in Brief and it's the third edition and it came out at the same time as the 12th edition but it puts everything in what I would call easy to understand plain language and if you want a deeper dive it refers to the Roberts Rules book so you can go into a deeper dive and this will handle about 98 percent of anything you folks ever have to deal with so this if you're looking for a good Roberts reference this is the book I would get. So let's talk a little bit about motions because that's how we do our business. A motion is a formal proposal by a member of a body in a meeting that the body takes certain action. Pretty straightforward. Under Roberts, motions are required on substantive issues. You should avoid negative motions. So what's a negative motion? Well, someone might make a motion not to send the mayor and the council president not to send the mayor and the council president to the league's annual meeting. So if the motion passes, then they don't go. But if the motion fails, do they go? Mm -hmm. So that's a negative motion where the outcome of the motion is unclear. A better way to uh, propose such a motion is I propose not to send anybody to the league's annual meeting. And then it's clear that if it passes, you've got the same issue, right? So what you wanna do is make a positive motion. You vote, you move to send somebody or ask somebody to do something or take some action as opposed to not to take action because the result is unclear through that approach. The motion, once it's um, made and seconded, should be uh, fully stated and then repeated by the chair. So if you're running a committee, uh, the motion would be made, motion would be seconded, and then the chair if you're acting as chair, would repeat the motion in its entirety. And under state law, as I mentioned before, the motion must be seconded. In Roberts, and most committees operate this way, uh, regardless of state law, uh, the second is intended to show interest in the motion. If you second the motion, it doesn't mean you want the motion. In fact, you might want the motion to fail. Mm -hmm. So you want it brought up so you can vote it down, right? So, um, but in Latin committees, you have a whole bunch of discussion and then someone makes a motion. Well, it's pretty clear there's interest in the topic, right? Because you've already had a lot of discussion. And again, in committees, sometimes you make the motion, you forget you should ask for a second and you just proceed to uh, more discussion than a vote. So in Roberts, that's incidental and they feel under Roberts, that would act as a second because again, the purpose of a second is to show interest in the motion. So the main motion starts the discussion. 
Very important, only one main motion may be pending at any given time. So if someone makes a main motion and someone makes another main motion, the chair then should rule the second main motion out of order and ask, basically ask the person to bring it up after this motion is uh, dealt with. Now, there's other classes of motion. There's privilege motions, subsidiary motions, and incidental motions. And in Roberts, those can get really confusing really fast. I'll hopefully provide you a semi-clear explanation uh, in a couple of seconds. So we start with the main motion, and I love this meme, which is the motion was called in order to discuss the meat. It's been pointed out there is no more meat. A motion has been made to fight over the bones. <laughs> And some meetings may go that way. So the main motion starts the discussion. It's very simple. I move that, whatever that is. And the motion uh, should be simple, plain language. Uh, it should not be a higher paragraph about whatever you're interested in a particular issue. If you're making the motion, it should just be very straightforward. So I mentioned before there's privilege motions and typically they relate to the meeting themselves. So. For example, you're in a meeting, you're on agenda item two, and the chair says, now we're gonna to move to agenda item four. You might say, I'm calling for orders. That's the arcane language Robert uses. You might just say, hey, what happened to agenda item three? Why aren't we on agenda item three? Then the chair would go, oh yeah, that's right. We should have been on agenda item three. So that's basically call for orders. Uh, let's say it's, you uh, need some kind of a break, bathroom break, whatever, you might move for 10 minute recess. Again, that would be a privileged motion. Um, or you might want to fix a time to adjourn a little bit later when we go through this uh, proceedings chart. I have a little test that uh, will cover the motion to fix a time to adjourn. Then there are the subsidiary, oops, I gotta, sorry. Then there are the subsidiary motions, which typically amend the main motion or procedures. So there's the, um, again, they relate to the treatment of main motions. There we go, lay on the table. Um, there's a lot, tabling or laying something on the table is very confused, confusing because the Congress uses tabling things very differently than the state legislature and the state legislature does it very differently than Roberts does it. So if you're watching C-SPAN or some state proceedings, ignore all of their meeting procedures because they don't apply to you. In fact, <laughs> Congress has its own book and there's another book uh, was written for state legislators. So previous question, in other words, you wanna close discussion. Sometimes that's call the question. Um, and really important about calling the question is when the question is called, you immediately move to a vote on whether to close discussion and it has to have a two thirds majority. So it has to have an extraordinary majority, not a simple majority. Do you need a second for that to close it? Yes, because it's like any other motion. Yeah. Uh, you vote to amend, that's the most common motion. Uh, you might vote to postpone to a later time. You might move to refer an item to a committee and we'll talk about that some more. And you might move to extend debate. The topic has got a lot of interest. There's obviously a lot of discussion, a lot of points to be raised. And so under Roberts, you basically get 10 minutes twice. But 10 minutes twice is a long time. A lot of council rules, a lot of local government rules give three minutes and, but maybe not limit the number of times you can speak. Uh, but Roberts, under Roberts, you have the right to speak 10 minutes at, at any one time, twice during a discussion. But whatever the topic is may require more time than that. Not sure what that would be. Hopefully you'll never have to find one of those. But if there is one, uh, that's how you would ex um, extend debate. But again, because you're changing the rules, it requires a two thirds vote. So incidental motions relate to the conduct of the meeting. So for example, you've got a, uh, uh, a multiple item motion that the chair or one of you decides should be broken down into smaller parts so they're easier to deal with. 
Uh, points of order we talked about a minute ago. Withdrawing a motion is the one area where you differ from Roberts because in Roberts, it just takes a majority vote. Um, appeal a decision of the chair. Typically that's uh, someone's asked for the chair to make a point of order. The chair is ruled in a manner that the person doesn't like. And so then the person wants to appeal the ruling of the chair. And we'll talk some more about how that works. You may want to suspend the rules for whatever reason. Um, and if you have amendments it, oops, in separate parts, you might want to break those down. So what I've given you here is a motions chart and part one are the um, precedence of the motions. So if you look down at the bottom, number 10 is making a main motion. If you notice, that's got the lowest order of precedence and all the way up to 21 close the meeting all have higher order of proceedings. So if you're chairing a committee or you're in one of these meetings, and I'll show you how this works in a little bit, but basically um, the main motion is the lowest form of the motion uh, process. Uh, and so if anybody makes a motion above the main motion, like closing debate, postponing to a certain time, referring to committee or whatever, it has this order of proceedings. Then the second page oops, is incidental motions. They don't have an order of precedence because when you make an incidental motion, they typically are decided immediately, whatever it is. Um, enforce the rules, get back on the agenda. And then part three is when you're trying to bring something that's already been decided back before the body. Uh, and those have some special rules, which I'll talk about. So keep this handy because you'll be referring to here in a, in a minute. So what is the motions live start to finish? So there's eight steps, pretty simple. Obtain the floor. And I, is that usually by a show of hands or raising a hand? Uh, a lot of places are using the electronic things, but you're not that big yet. Uh, you don't have that many members, I should say. Uh, then you make the motion. The motion gets seconded and the chair restates. Then the body discusses. After the discussion is done, put to a vote, you vote, and the result is announced. So it's all pretty simple, right? So let's go through each step. So obtain the floor. Typically raise your hand, and then you wait to be recognized. So you don't start into your motion until you're recognized. So that's really important. You make your motion. It's a proposal to take action. I move that, whatever that is. You must clearly state the motion. Again, no negative motions. You don't need so moved afterwards, although if you watch any TV, you see that all the time. Um, and the motion should include a brief, heavy emphasis on the word brief, description of what you're talking about. This is not the time to make your impassioned plea for why your motion should be favored. That's for the discussion. This should just say, I wanna buy everybody computers because I think everybody needs a new computer. Then the motion gets seconded. And as I mentioned before, it's by another member. It means you're, it's worthy of discussion, but doesn't mean you favor it. You want to make sure you have a second always. But under Roberts, they suggest even, especially under substantive motions, if it's a committee recommendation, it's typically not needed under Roberts because the committee has already had some discussion and bringing it to you folks for action. Um, and you should get it before the starting discussion, but really important, especially since state law requires a second, that even if uh, there's a lot of discussion, the clerk or whoever's keeping the minutes should make sure that they record someone seconding the motion. Uh, now, if you don't, record somebody seconding, is someone gonna sue you under state law? I don't think so, but at any rate. Um, also, and your rule here changes a little bit, but withdrawing a second has no motion on, or no impact on the motion's validity. Once it's moved and seconded and presented to the body by the chair, you all now own the motion. So the motion maker and the motion seconder under your rules have the ability, if someone wants to make some amendment, have to or wants to have the motion withdrawn, they have to agree to it. But that's the 
the, the difference from what Roberts has. So then the chair restates, it's been moved and seconded that, whatever that is. And the reason for the chair to restate the motion is one, so that you all clearly understand what the motion is, but just as important, whoever's taking minutes has a chance to write down, make sure the mo motion has been correctly uh, written down. As I mentioned, it transfers ownership to all of you now. Um, and so it can't be taken or withdrawn if the motion maker realizes all of a sudden it was a bad idea. They can't say, oh, never mind, I've changed my mind. I don't want that motion anymore. The body owns it. So then you have to go through a vote to withdraw the motion. So when you withdraw a motion, uh, again, once it's made and second and restated by the chair, any motion changes the motion are subject to the will of the body. And your rule 1.06 says, no motion shall be amended or withdrawn without consent of the alder person making the same and the alder person seconding. So that's a little change from Roberts. Then you discuss the motion. And the reason to discuss the motion is it may need fine tuning. Sometimes, especially in committees, it happens before the motion's even made. Um, and really important for anybody chairing a body, even if it appears there's plenty of discussion after, before a motion is made, you wanna be sure that you have the motion, it has a second, and you wanna be sure that even after the second and restating to the body, whoever's chairing the group should make sure that anybody can still comment. So amendments, amending is not a substitute motion. So in the Congress and sometimes in the state legislature, you'll see them basically make a motion that completely guts the entire bill and introduces a whole new bill. Under Roberts, an amendment is to uh, uh, amend a motion, but it's not intended to be a substitute for the motion. Main motions can always be amended, but they have to be germane. So if you're talking about buying new computers and somebody wants to make an amendment to buy the public works chair or new or public works director, a new pickup truck, that could go one of two ways if you're the chair. One, you could say computers, trucks, not the same, not germane. The chair could also say procurement's procurement. So yeah, we'll let, we'll let that in. So it's really up to the chair, but let's say the chair rules, yeah, we'll let the truck in. The rest of you are thinking, no, trucks and computers aren't the same. You immediately make a point of order, objecting to the, the chair's ruling. And then uh, you would vote on whether the chair's ruling should be sustained. And you're gonna hear me say that a couple, three times tonight. Um, and the reason for that is uh, when we lived in Atlanta, my wife who's very Catholic, uh, was born, raised in Wisconsin, um, decided she wanted to go to one of these evangelical churches. So we went to one and us and 4,998 of our closest friends <laughs> were all there. Uh, it's basically a rock concert disguised as a church service. And when the pastor who was a gentleman named Andy Stanley, who's written some great leadership books. If you're looking for some great leadership books, he's written a bunch of good ones. Um, he was giving his talk. It wasn't really a sermon. And it wasn't really a talk. Not really sure what it was, but he gave his talk. And I noticed after about five minutes that he was repeating himself frequently and drove me crazy. And so I, you know, Service is over, they end with a big song, we get out to the parking lot and 45 minutes later, we're on our way home, right? Because it takes a long time for 4, 000, you know, 2,500 cars or whatever it was to get out of there. Mm -hmm. And so on the way home, uh, my wife says, well, what'd you think? And I've learned the best way to respond to that question is say, well, I don't know, honey, what do you think? <laughs> she says, well, it was wonderful. I thought it was, the music was great. And I really liked the fact he repeated himself. Mm -hmm. And I said, <laughs> hmm. She might be onto something here. So that's when I learned that repetition is not a bad thing and it's a good way for uh, to teach your people or help people learn something. So you'll be hearing myself repeating myself tonight. That's the third time I've just said that. Um, and yes, it's my wife's fault that I repeat myself. So um, amendments require a motion stating the amendment, a second and a vote. And if you look at your proceedings, what's the next item above number 10? 
Kill. Kill. What's the next item above that? Modify. 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 That's the amend the motion. So that's why it takes precedence. And again, any amendment is a is the body's decision. There's no such thing as friendly amendments. On our website under parliamentary procedure, you'll we have a number of videos. We have a cute little one about friendly amendments. And I'll warn you ahead of time. Have any of you been on It's a Small World ride in Disney World or Disneyland? All right, well, first I apologize for putting that music back in your head because we'll be there all night. Uh, so the music on this is the same kind of earworm sort of music. Um, but basically, someone makes a motion, someone makes a second, and immediately someone says, I'd like to make a friendly amendment, as if you and the motion maker can just decide yourselves to amend the motion. Again, once it comes to the body, restated by the chair, it's the body's decision whether to allow the amendment. So amendments are debatable, and they're amendable, but I strongly suggest to any of you chairing a group to only allow one amendment to amendment at a time. If there's multiple amendments, just have the people who made their amendments second, third, and fourth hold off until you deal with the amendment to the amendment. Otherwise, you'll, you'll get very confused. You won't know what you're talking about. Um, and then once voted on, the matter's settled. So you can't bring up, let's say, to go back to the computer thing, someone wanted to uh, add the pickup truck, that amendment was allowed, that amendment was voted down, and then someone later says they want to buy a special form of transportation for the public works director. Well, what else would that be other than a pickup truck? It's transportation, so the chair then should rule that is that amendment is not germane because it's already been dealt with. So, Lots of times, especially uh, for new matters brought before you folks, you may become apparent that the motion should be referred to a standing or special committee for further study and input. So the member, any of you could make a motion to refer the matter to a standing or special committee. Again, that requires a second. That motion could be amendable. And usually that motion's made with the item uh, the, with a report by whoever that motion's being sent to coming back to all of you within a month or two months, sometimes certain. Not always, but that's usually the best practice. So postpone and tabling. I talked earlier about tabling being the most confusing thing there is for under Roberts. And that's because lots of times you don't know what the member's intent was. So. Under Roberts, you can postpone to a time later in the meeting. So typically when you lay something on the table or you ask to table a motion at a meeting, it's because some other matter is more pressing and you wanna deal with that more pressing matter right now. So you go out of order on the agenda. So the way, if it was me making the motion, I'd like to table item three to later in the meeting uh, so that we can discuss item six or item four, or whatever item you're talking about. If you make a motion to table, it gets seconded, it gets passed, but does not, does not have a time certain, then it cannot be brought back before the body unless a new motion is made and a new second. And then of course, under the open meetings law, that would have to be on the agenda. So really you couldn't bring it back for two meetings. So if you're the chair, what you wanna make sure is that you understand the intent of the person tabling the motion. Do they wanna bring it back later in the same meeting, which means you just move the agenda around? Uh, do they wanna bring it back at a later date? In other words, you got other business, we'll talk about, the, we'll add this to next meeting, next month's meeting agenda. Um, or, do you want to postpone indefinitely? So if you postpone indefinitely, that means you've killed the motion. It's if, it, if the motion to kill indefinitely gets seconded and passes, then it dies never coming back. So that's why it's important for the chair to clarify the member's intent as to why they want to table the motion so that everybody understands the impact of what happens. So I threatened to use this and now we're going to. So we're gonna have a little exercise here. So the order, uh, order of precedence is an important part of parliament, parliament procedure. And so we'll talk about how it works. 
So first and foremost, member A makes a main motion. I move to buy a new computer for the clerk and member D seconds. I used to use numbers here and then I realized all these districts had numbers and I got in trouble once so I, I use letters. Member C thinks the entire city staff should have a new computer and moves to amend the motion accordingly. Member D seconds. Now, member B realizes this is going to take a lot more longer time for the entire agenda to discuss this new computer business. And he has a chicken dinner waiting for him and wants to limit the discussion on the whole computer business to 10 minutes. And again, member D seconds. Are you getting a sense of member D? Uh, now, member B, thinking about member uh, is getting now hungry because they've been talking about it's thinking about the chicken dinner so then wants a 10 minute recess to get a candy bar but cleverly disguise their intent by noting a need for restroom break again member d seconds so how does the chair handle these various motions so you've got the main motion 10 which as i mentioned is the lowest order of precedence you've got an amendment which is 12 which is a higher order proceedings to the main motion. You've got uh, limit, to, limit debate, which is 15. order proceedings 15. And then you have take a break. Notice that's really near the top of the order of proceedings. So under Roberts, you've got these four uh, motions and they get handled in reverse order based on the order of proceedings. So take a break is first, limit discussion or debate is second, the amendment, dealing with the amendment is third. So in this case, the body votes to approve computers for everybody. So why are you voting on the main motion? Because the second, the, the amendment took care of everything. We are voting on the main motion because all the amendment does is amend the main motion. You still have the main motion on the floor. So if you may be wondering, well, we just dealt with that in the amendment. The reason you vote on the main motion is because that's what you're amending. Even though you effectively vote for the same thing twice in this instance. Does that make sense? Okay. So, a little side trip on discussion. The chair guides the debate discussion. You discuss. Highly recommend you focus on problem solving. Make sure you have facts. And most importantly, respect each other's opinions and thoughts. You all, you know, we all, even if we're all in favor of something, we might be in favor of it in different ways or different ways of thinking. So, um, if, by listening to understand, each other because most of the time when we listen to something we're listening to reply i suffer that greatly with my spouse she says something and i'm already about to, you know thinking ways to tell her she's wrong instead of trying to understand what it is she's telling me uh, facts are really important elusive but really important and i think if you all have respect for each other treat each other with, like the golden rule you'll never have any issue on discussion so what happens, though, in the case where, obviously not this group, but you might have a committee with a citizen member on it, let's lose, use that, and that person wants to dominate the discussion, what happens? Well, first and foremost, the chair is responsible for administering the body's deliberations. So the chair must take control of the meeting. The chair should seek balanced participation. So if you have a motion and a second, and you go to discussion, typically the person making the motion will speak first. And then whoever's chairing the meeting should ask, is there anybody in opposition that wants to speak? Then that person would speak. Then the chair would say, is there anybody supporting? So you would go back and forth until everyone has a chance to add whatever discussion they wanna add. And again, as I mentioned, Robert's rule said there's a 10 minute limit and twice on any issue. Um, I strongly encourage local governments to consider writing their own rules if they follow Roberts, because that's 20 minutes per person. When you have two, four, mm -hmm. six, eight. Yeah. That's a lot of time for one motion. 
Um, my view is that three minutes, uh, we either unlimited or three minutes, two or three times is more than enough time for everyone to make the points they want to make. But you make your own rules so you can decide. All right, so ending discussion. So if you're the chair, there's some ways to enter end discussion. One way is to seek unanimous consent. You can do that by saying, any further discussion? Are you ready to vote? Uh, I got this from uh, our county board chair. He always says, any new points before we vote? Which is a good way of sort of, you know, don't repeat yourselves. Um, or council member so-and-so is ready to vote. Is it the unanimous view of the council to close discussion and move to vote? All those are ways of seeking unanimous consent. Um, and the, because it's unanimous consent, if nobody objects, that's why it becomes unanimous consent. But the presiding officer cannot end the discussion on their own. If the providing officer, officer says any further discussion and someone says yes, and assuming they haven't spoken for 20 minutes, 10 minutes each twice, then the chair should recognize that discussion. If the providing officer says, well, I want to get to the vote, I'm tired of all this discussion, then you could make a point of order telling the chair that they cannot end discussion on their own. And if the chair insists on any discussion, you can either appeal the, the ruling of the chair or you can uh, ask for uh, call the question that requires a two thirds vote. So the only way you can end discussion if there's an objection is to make a motion a second and two thirds of you vote in favor of it. So I'm from Illinois, so this used to be funny, vote early and vote often. It's <laughs> maybe not as funny, maybe I should find a different meme there. Um, but we used to be proud of that when I lived in Illinois. Uh, the presiding officer restates the question and the effect of a yes or no vote. You can take votes in a variety of ways. Most folks uh, either do a roll call or, uh, or a voice vote. If you do a voice vote, as I mentioned earlier, any of you could ask for a roll call if you want to see it on the record. If you're making a motion to close your meeting uh, under one of the statutory requirements, that should always be a roll call vote. And the reason for that is, is if you have a roll call vote and you vote against going in the meeting, closing the meeting, and later a court determines that the meeting was illegally closed or unlawfully closed, you're off the hook for liability. Mm -hmm. So some of you new members may think, well, I'm always voting no to close meetings because I never want to be liable, but I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm saying is that <clears throat> that's why it's really important to have a roll call vote. But if it's clear it's unanimous to close the meeting, then the minutes should just reflect that it was unanimous, unanimous decision. So, a little side trip on voting. Uh, you notice the golf course theme here. I love to play golf. So I figured since I'm doing the presentations, I can have my own places I want to take a side trip to. So quorum, two thirds must vote. That's your requirement. Uh, unless there's a roll call vote, there's no record of an individual abstaining from a vote. Mm. And you're not required to vote. The city of Madison had a rule that every uh, city council member had to vote. And they had a meeting where one of the city council members declined to vote. And he was fined under the city council's procedures. He went to federal court. And the federal district court for the Western District of Wisconsin found that the council member had a First Amendment right to vote or not to vote. Hmm. Voting was considered part of their First Amendment rights. Uh, so really important, you don't have to vote. But the other consideration I think you should keep in mind is you were elected to help make decisions to make the city better. So unless it's really a crisis of conscience, always suggest you vote. Dan, just a follow up question on that. So if if that's the case, somebody chooses not to vote, um, do they say present or can they say nothing and then we just mark them as present in the minutes? Uh, what's the best way to handle that? Um, I'm gonna to get to that in just a minute. Good question. 
And then under your rules, under state law, obviously the mayor may break a tie. But again, the mayor doesn't have any obligation, any more obligation to vote than any one of you. So if it's a tie and the mayor decides, I'm not breaking this tie, then the motion fails. So in a way, the mayor has weighed in. Because a tie vote, the motion fails because there's not a majority. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I live in the town of Burke. We are surrounded by Sun Prairie, Madison, DeForest, and Windsor. Uh, and if you go half a mile in any direction from my house, you're in a whole new place. Um, and they had a city attorney there that opined that a tie vote meant the motion passed. Still not, he's not the city attorney anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> So conflict of interest, here we got arts versus vandalism. Uh, so conflicts of interest. Um, you should remove yourself from the participating or voting, but you don't have to disclose, disclose the conflict. If you just claim you have a conflict, that's all you have to say. Mm. But highly recommend that if you have a conflict, you leave the room. Do not stay. And the reason for that is your facial reactions, your body language can be a tip off to other people about how you really feel about something. So the best rule of action for anybody that believes they have a conflict of interest is to lead the room. Now that means that that person's no longer available for quorum purposes. So if you lead the room, that might screw up the quorum, which means the meetings for that item can't go forward. Um, Can I ask if someone was to leave for that purpose? So say it was a long debate, do they just go hang out in the hallway and then Brian goes and gets them back or? Yeah, oh, I know right. there's a couple bars nearby so they can probably <laughs> just go to one of Yeah, so that, yeah. I'll call you, okay. Yeah, first booth in. <laughs> I, an, another question too, how, to, how do you remove yourself from participation or voting other than leaving the room? Do you, I mean, do you let the chair or the mayor know ahead of time? So that's really a matter of personal preference. Um, do you have an ethics group here? So you can ask the ethics group for an opinion mm -hmm. on how to handle your, your perceived conflict mm -hmm. or your actual conflict. Um, Whatever they tell you, if you follow those rules, then you're off the hook in terms of if they told you wrong um, and you followed their rules, you're, you're still fine. But for voting purposes, it's always best to leave. To leave. So, and all you can say is, uh, I have a conflict on this issue, I'll leave the room so I'm, you know, I'm not part of the considerate discussion or consideration. If you want as a courtesy to tell the mayor or the chair ahead of time that um, I think that's best practice, but it's really up to each of you. Um, also good idea if someone does have a conflict and leaves to have a roll call vote so it's clear the person wasn't present. And I think the minister record they left the room before the discussion started just so it's clear that the person wasn't here. Um, also, a couple other fun things. Before the final result, so let's say you're in a meeting, you're starting to voting, and you start over here. And you get over here, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to change my vote. As long as the vote hasn't been announced, you can change your vote. But once it's announced, your vote is the vote. You just interrupt the crowd in, in the process. You just say, oh. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Point of order, I'd like to change my vote. That, Never really, go wrong with starting with point of order. That, that's a really good point, because on Zoom, sometimes we would struggle because you're trying oh, to yeah, get trying to mute. Find that. And so that sometimes would happen. We thought people were voting against something because by the time they unmuted, yeah. it was chiming through. So okay. thank you for sharing that. Uh, and again, uh, tie vote, motion fails as there's no majority. Now the fun part. So abstentions, getting to uh, <clears throat> Brian's question and kind of your question. Uh, I think it's best to vote present, not abstain, because abstention rules can get a little squirrely as far as quorum issues are concerned. By voting present, you're here, so it's clear 
the, the quorum still um, is there. But again, um, citizens expect your representation. So keep that in mind when you're deciding to vote present. So now we get to the result. The presiding officer announced results. Motion carried or failed. And if you've done a roll call by the number of votes on each side, if known, or if it's clear it's unanimous, could just say unanimous. So is it just on that, if, if we're going through, as we typically do, all those in favor say, yes, those are dense, don't say any abstentions, it would be okay to say, I, I would like to vote present, not abstention. Well, or I mean, when the voting, up. you could, yeah, I mean, um, is that how you typically do it? Ask for abstentions? Yeah, that, oh, that would no, be. Yeah, that would be. So call. it would be a contradicting that ask, I guess. I would just, yeah. yeah. So then that, that would be the correct response. I vote present. That's my suggestion. Yeah. And, and then the minutes, unless it's a roll call vote, the minutes would not reflect that Calder Schaefer voted present, or would they? Well, if it, if it isn't a roll call vote, you wouldn't even know. If it, you follow what I'm saying? I do, but our, our minutes typically will say, you know, who abstained or who voted present. So if someone announces they vote present, then I think the minutes should reflect that. Okay. That's my, my opinion. So it, it, would, it would just be like, uh, I mean, if it's a voice vote and- I mean, in a voice vote, your, it usually comes up as a question, any, any abstentions? And so that you would so interrupt just, at that point. Just listen as five. Yeah. Five dash one one a and one present. So yep. It's like a hockey score. Yeah. Okay. But not not. That's good. I have to remember that. But not with, not with the last name of who was voting present for. Yeah, that, and that's fine. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> so. Let's talk a little bit about points of order. And again, if you look at 1.03 of your uh, common council meeting rules, uh, control of the meeting. So points out a discrepancy in the meeting rules. It needs to be made when the infraction or mistakes occurs, not a week later, mm -hmm. not the next day when you've realized that something went awry that should not have gone awry, it has to happen at the time it occurs or reasonably contemporaneous with that. Um, you would state the point of order. I make a point of order that you're not on the agenda. I make a point of order that, you know, whatever it is. And then the chair determines for or against the point of order. So how to appeal the chair's point of order. First thing, uh, don't throw eggs at the mayor. <laughs> or the chair. Uh, this is from the Ukrainian parliament about 10 years ago. And the two things I found interesting here was one, somebody had the foresight to bring an umbrella to avoid getting hit by the eggs and obviously didn't aim it in the right direction. So and somebody so, obviously thought to bring the eggs too. Yeah. Um, so the member says, I appeal the chair's decision. The chair says the decision of the chair is appealed. The chair then clearly states the exact question and issue and the reasons for their ruling on the point of order. And then the vote is, shall the decision of the chair be sustained? So if it's a yes vote, you agree with the chair's uh, point of order ruling. If it's a no vote, you disagree. So, I found this when I was looking for something else, which is how I usually find most of my good stuff. But I think this is great advice for any of you. And that is trying to please everyone is impossible. If you did that, you'd end up in the middle with nobody liking you. Just gotta make the decision about what you think is your best and do it. And even though it looks like Bob Dylan, John Lennon actually said this. <laughs> So got some resources um, listed there. Our website's got a lot of stuff on it. Uh, the Roberts Rules in Brief book. Basically, you can buy that at Roberts at any bookseller. Uh, I think this was like six bucks on Amazon. I think the Roberts book is like 15. Um, uh, and also the Office of Open Government. If you have any open meeting law questions, they publish a great guide 
on uh, open meetings or public meetings and public records. They have two great guides, I should say. And also, uh, I'm a resource if you have questions. And I mentioned earlier the Certified Public Manager Program, and we appreciate uh, the city's support of the program. Brian Wolpholder graduated this year, um, and it was a great, uh, he was the class uh, reflection speaker and gave a great reflection uh, to the class that uh, went really well. Um, and we're starting up another cohort this September in Madison. We might do Milwaukee if we have enough interest, but this cohort's going to be uh, a little different in that we are going to allow folks from other parts of the state to participate partially in person, but mostly virtually so that we can um, get our spread out a little bit. And with that, but if you're wondering more about what the CPM program is, there's two great slides. You can read them tonight if you're having trouble sleeping. Here's my contact information. I'm available. I do a lot of public records, open meetings, parliamentary procedure, budget and finance. Um, and if I can't answer your question, I'll find an answer for your question. And then the other thing is we get a lot of citizen calls because the league or the towns or the county association will handle citizen calls. Um, if someone calls and upset about something here with the city, our practice uh, is that we usually will call the municipality that the person's upset with um, because usually they're forum shopping. They didn't get the answer they wanted from somebody, so they're going to keep calling up people until someone gives them the answer they want and just basically let you know this person's called and here's what their concern is. Um, a million years ago, when I worked at the League of uh, Minnesota uh, Municipalities, the um, we got a, that was back in the days where people sent letters. I was a research assistant. We got a letter about a guy upset that the city would not allow him to bury his grandmother in his backyard. Mm. Uh, primarily because the city had a city cemetery and that was the rule. So I called the village, it was up in Northern Minnesota. It turns out this guy was a village board member. <laughs> oh. Anyway, it was kind of weird. Um, so that's why that's our practice. Uh, with that, I'm, I think I've covered everything I was asked to cover, I hope so. Um, any questions? Yeah, does so anyone have any questions? Lisa, go ahead. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed the uh, refresher and uh, forward to us implementing everything we've learned. Um, so a couple questions for you. A simple one first. Our city attorney has a copy of Robert's Rules from, I believe, 1986. Has a lot changed since that time? Um, there's been a number of updates, so yes, I would definitely get the lead, the twelfth edition. Since your rules refer to the latest edition, and I, I have the eleventh in my in my materials, so I've got that available. Okay, that's great. Um, and then, so one thing that we do, I want to go through the the motion of of making a substitute motion. So we don't typically withdraw a motion. Actually, we do, but we don't think we vote on the withdrawal. We just say, oh, you know what, changed my mind. I withdraw it and the second will withdraw. So it seems like we need to tweak that because it's become, once it's seconded, it's become it's, owned yeah, it's the by body's, the body. It's so. the body decision. But, so there's a couple ways to think about that. If your practice is that if it's been seconded and then the person decides to withdraw it, your rules basically say the the, the person making the motion, the second have to agree to withdraw it. Um, but if nobody says anything, then that could be con construed as unanimous consent. But I think a better practice would be to actually go through the formal motion second and vote. Okay. One thing we do also is someone will make a motion. For instance, um, my colleague in District 7 made a motion to uh, cancel the construction of a sidewalk and then another alder made a substitute motion to go forward with it, which under our practices bumps the main motion previously made down to the bottom. Now we're considering whether to go forward with the construction, we voted in favor. So that meant we never went back to the original. And I'm, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering what, what's the difference between making a substitute motion 
and either withdrawing it or amending it because we use the term substitute. Yeah. So what I would do is make that clear in your rules that that's how you're doing it because Roberts basically says, no, you're not making substitute motions. You can amend the motion. Um, so for example, if the motion was to stop a project, um, the project's already underway, right? It's coming up. Okay, but, but it's already been approved? Yeah. Okay. The council previously approved the project. That's what I was trying to say. And it, and it was brought back to the council, you know, again for reconsideration. Right, okay. Yeah. So under Roberts, voting down the motion to withdraw would have had the effect of keeping the project in play, right? right? Because it was yeah. already approved. But if it's something brand new by the public works director pickup truck, yep. um, and somebody, the, I think the better practice would be just to vote the motion down right. rather than having the substitute motion because now you just made things a lot less clear. Mm -hmm. Yep. That, I, that's, that's so what I, was I would either amend too. your rules or start following Roberts. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, in that case, the, the substitute motion was meant to sort of open a discussion as to why we want to turn down yeah, that so existing rule on the, that question. The substitute motion really could have been just a second right. worthy of discussion. Yeah. And then you could have the discussion, why are we what why did why do you want not to do this or why do you want to do this or how yeah, why is. why I'm gonna vote no and yeah, want my colleagues exactly. to vote no. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's what really we're trying to do is yeah. Right. So I would I think the correct kind of way is opinion. make a motion to withdraw the project from the list of other projects already approved. Second discussion. discussion vote. Yeah. And another option would have been to just leave the motion unseconded. And then yes, it dies. Because it fails. If, there's yeah. no second, if you want to watch a great video about it, uh, what happens when something dies from a second, Village of Carpentersville, Illinois, there's many, but try to find the first one. Um, it's about 10 minutes long. And the highlight is of the video comes after about the first minute and a half where the mayor castigates the village board for not, he wanted to appoint someone to fill a vacant position and there was no second. And then the rest of it, I won't even tell you how it ends, but it, that was the highlight of the, of the discussion yeah. and it, from a civility standpoint. <laughs> um, and then the guy who was in charge of uh, the meeting procedures, uh, had they been Roberts, made a series of odd decisions. Let's just put it that way. But it's pretty entertaining. Uh, there's like 10 different videos with the same cast of characters. Sounds like a good good could town. You, um, John, could you have I, also just done it through number 11 by killing the main, putting out a motion to kill the main motion? Yeah, so that's, um, once the body has the motion, you could, yeah. um, uh, Hmm. Oh, so instead of yeah. yeah yeah because then that would take pre proceedings but that would be a um a subsidiary motion I believe. Yeah, okay okay so so instead of making a substitute so motion, motion i'm sorry instead of making the substitute motion someone could have said i move the motion be postponed indefinitely and then if that gets approved uh then we're good to go yeah that's an incidental motion which is why it's not a main motion okay but, but so then, if nobody seconded, I guess that's irrelevant, but that would be yeah. Right. Yeah. a way to do that. So that, yeah, so you've got, a, again, to recap, no second means it fails. A second. Um, we can vote. We can bring can up have a discussion and then vote against it, which means it fails. Um, or we or can be, go for it and kill it. You can, <laughs> yeah, you can vote. You can uh, make an incidental motion to kill the main motion. Mm. Definitely. When when amending, because this happens a lot, where somebody will make a motion to approve something, and then we need to specify in an amount not to exceed. So that type of amendment we would call a friendly amendment. But it sounds like if we're making that amendment, do we need to do we need to vote on adding that wording? Yes. So if you're making, if you have a main motion on the floor mm -hmm. and you make any amendment to it. The amendment needs a second, there's discussion, you vote on the amendment, and then you eventually get to the main motion. As amended. As amended. As amended, correct. Thank, thank you. Or as if, if the amendment passed.
Right. Okay. And then the last question I have in case Alder Schaefer doesn't ask it, what about moving to approve the minutes of the meeting? <laughs> yes. I was I'd learned in Roberts that you don't, you can't approve minutes. You accept them as submitted because it's not a question of right of, of good or bad. It's, it's they're either accurate or they're not. Yeah. So is anybody going to League 101 tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you'll hear me expand on this topic because I speak for a long period of time. But um, in my mind, you should never accept or approve reports. You should only receive them. Because if you approve them, and whatever's in that report, for example, language sending me Hawaii for two weeks, yeah. uh, you've approved, even though you probably never read the report. So I would just receive reports from any department heads or anybody else from the outside that gives you a report. Um, and then- uh, I have a question along that same line because- Well, let me finish oh. answering his question. As far as minutes are concerned, yeah. um, you can accept them, you can approve them. The, the, the effect is the same in my mind. So um, I don't think it makes much difference if you decide you're gonna approve your minutes or if you're going to accept the minutes, because yeah, I, I guess to me, and in, in yes, in the see. earlier version of Robert, I heard when you're proving it, it's like yes, you're, you're putting a moral yes. statement on that. That's well, that, you're that, that, that they're good minutes. I, I think most people would view that as yeah. you're not you're approving the minutes as an accurate reflection of what yeah. happened, yeah. Yeah. Okay. not that you're approving what happened. Yeah. So the bottom line, it's not a the big actions deal. that happen that the minutes are reflected. Right. Right. Well, my my Kindle well, version of the third Lisa, edition. Before we get to you, oh, okay, go ahead. To yeah, so, the minutes. So, so, uh, on the same with discussion on minutes, because this happened actually tonight. We had, we had a commission meeting. It's all new commission members, except for one, two people. So one of the commission members said, "I I don't know how can I approve this when I was never here before and don't know anything about it." And so that's why, to to, to uh, John's point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it almost makes sense to, yeah, you can review and say, oh, there's something wrong here. We need to fix some language or there's an error in it. But still, you know, either accept them. I don't know. You know how do you get around that? Because it just, let's just acknowledge the minutes. <laughs> I mean, there's, there, like in that case, I think there that's were, when you're talking about acknowledging submission, acknowledging the report. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, and my sense is if I wasn't there, I don't vote. I become a, a non-voter. So, the practical effect of that the minutes aren't approved. Yeah. What happens? Then we get to the hard work. <laughs> minutes are still the minutes. Yeah. So un unless somebody I guess the issue would, with the minutes. Um, that's where that yeah. yeah. So so by approving the minutes now we've move six months down the road and somebody, I don't know, someone goes, oh, I don't know, I, you know, they disagree with the proceedings of that meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's the, I don't know how that, I mean, it's never happened to my. I mean, and there is also, that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, and my my copy of the Roberts Rules in Brief says that um, after there have been any corrections made to the minutes, then the chair says if there are no further corrections, the minutes are approved. So I think that gets gets around the question of what do you do when you have new members who say I can't vote on it, and it also saves time not having to vote on the minutes. For us, that the minutes are always on the consent agenda, so it's not a big deal. But I think this could be useful for other committees. Yes, I was going to say, I think they're on the plan commission, and that's when I think I get confused because I'm used to them being on the council meetings where we just absorb them in the, in the consent. And the, so um, there's 20 minutes of presentation I could give about the proper way to take minutes and what the minutes should reflect and what they shouldn't reflect. Mm. It's pretty straightforward. They should just reflect who was there. And the meeting started, what the, uh, any motions made and passed, any motions made failed aren't, like it never happened. 
um, and then a short description of any discussion items. Mm -hmm. uh, but they should not be a he said, she said, they said, uh, blow by blow account of the meeting. But just a simple summary of the discussion. Mm -hmm. These points. Yeah, it's like a summary of action items, not discussion items. Well, the so the discussion might be uh, the minutes might say uh, during the discussion these points were made, but they mm -hmm. wouldn't reflect made by who. Yeah. They wouldn't be editorialized like these stupid points were made. <laughs> Why did they make these points? Um, that sort Another of Brian but short and sweet to the point. Again. In state law, for minutes, that's pretty much the definition mm -hmm. that they require. So. Yeah, so uh, anyone else? Oh, no, go no, ahead. I, I just say so. Discussion to say, well, okay, in the meeting, the discussion was made, uh, the decision was made to purchase 20 computers. Uh, and uh, you wouldn't say, but you know, so and so disagreed because this computer, you know, was green and the other five, you know, were yellow. Yeah, you don't, you don't need all that. You just need the motion made, passed. If there was, if it was a discussion item that you were just discussing, there wasn't a motion, then the discussion revolved around X, Y, Z. Does anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Jim. I do. This actually might be a question for Brian, but first, thank you for advertising CPM program. I'm a graduate. I highly recommend it. So, <laughs> um, with regard to motions that fail um, by tie or otherwise. What is the process for them being brought back, right? So my experience is at the state legislative level where, right, you have to reintroduce in the next session. So how do we go about that? So this is where voting becomes interesting. Okay. Remember the example earlier about one of you changing your vote before the vote is announced? So yes, no, no, no. And you already know, you already got an idea where these others are gonna vote. You might change your vote. Mm -hmm to be on the majority side so that you can bring it up later because the rule under Roberts is you have to be in the majority to uh, bring a matter up for reconsideration. So that's where you're, if, if it's clear from the discussion, the motion might fail, but you really want, you really want to keep it alive. You might consider your vote, how you're, you know, which side you're going to vote on so you could, uh, Bring it back for reconsideration at some later date. But another way to do it, I think it's, it might be a better way to do it, is if it's clear that the motions either not working for some reason, maybe refer it to a committee for further study uh, so that some of the points um, that you, one of you feel is important maybe gets better uh, discussion, better consideration at a committee level, and then it can come back. Or you, the committee may find that whatever it is you thought was really important actually is not a good idea for whatever it, is. it could also be good information. So, so the rule for reconsideration is you have to be in the majority to bring it back. Um, but you might want to consider some other ways to get better information or and sending it to a committee is usually a good one. Just along that line, what would stop me from, I'm on, I'm on the losing side of that motion and then making another brand new motion that's slightly worded, just a tiny bit of skew. And the I chair mean, would have to rule whether your motion was germane or not. In other okay. words, was your motion effectively essentially Different. the same as the motion that failed? All right. All right. Um, and sometimes where that happens is not right away. It happens six months later. Yeah, I'm not going to do it, but I thought it. <laughs> yeah. So that's why it's really important as chair to, um, if someone's making a motion and it's clear this motion was very similar to one that was previously dealt with, uh, whether for or against, because um, you could be making <clears throat> this thing pass, but you were on the wrong end of the vote, but now you want to get rid of it through a, a future motion. Yeah. Then the chair just says motion is not germane to the yeah, discussion. Mo yeah, the, this motion is the same as or similar, essentially the same as the one we dealt with. You were on the wrong end of that vote, so I rule you out of order. Fair enough. Jeffrey, yeah. do you have any questions? Um, no, not really. I was just uh, listening, uh, and I 
you know, what David was saying happened in the airport commission. I think the concern with the gentleman was is you're asking us to approve, you're asking me to approve minutes that I don't know nothing about. You know, so how are you asking me to agree to something? You can always vote president. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, if if they've got a heartfelt concern, just advise them well then vote president if you don't feel like you can vote to approve. Okay. Randall, how about you? Are you okay? Do you have any questions? No, I don't have questions. So um, the mayor, the honorable mayor had a great idea. Um, if we would maybe just choose something that we learned that we didn't know today. Oh, and before I forget, uh, I sent Brian an evaluation link. We get, we have to, or we are, we have to, you don't have to, but I would appreciate it if you did fill out the evaluation form. And what we try to measure is what we knew about. There's basically three questions. Um, what you knew about the question before the presentation and what was your knowledge after the presentation? Sorry to interrupt. No, fine, thank you. I'll, I'll go first just so that they have time to think. So um, the one thing that it reminded me of uh, was the recess. And I only used that once in my time on city council and we were debating a very challenging uh, finance, the, the budget going forward, it was A or B. And the vote, we were missing one city councilman so the vote was already 3-3 three, three because I knew from Robert's rules I could pass because it was my first year. So I wasn't sure how people were voting. I kind of thought I knew what I wanted, but I was trying to read the tea leaves. So I did a pass and it was three to three and it was right back to me. I was the first person to vote. That's what it was. They did, they, however, we were sitting. So I said pass and I let the group go through and then it was back to me. And I was going to be the one to make the decision if the city was going to go with A or B, and that was it. So uh, a senior city councilman quietly said to me, you can ask for a recess. And I said, can I? And he goes, yeah. So I don't think I did it properly, but um, the city administrator and the attorney helped me through that motion. And then someone seconded, I think it was him, seconded it, and they gave me 10 minutes to go sit in the hallway and not be uh, in undue pressure so I could review it for myself. And I really appreciate um, in that moment that the senior city councilman was helping me. And in the end, I think we made the right decision. I made the right decision, but I took that moment. So I would hope that you all would never need to have a recess, but if you're doing say down to the budget, uh, there are things in here that will help you, especially in year one, take that moment. So. I'm going to go next. I did not realize that the mayor doesn't have to break the tie if she mm. doesn't want to. I thought that was part of her job. Such fun. Such <laughs> Just making fun. a sweat. And, no. and the other thing I didn't... Um, cover about the mayor is but your rules do the, the mayor actually can step down from the chair and turn it over to i assume the council president who would then chair the meeting the mayor's uh, and actually make a motion mm -hmm. or second a motion or speak in favor but if you're chairing a committee and you want to speak to a motion or make a motion you should turn the chair over to the next person in mm. line wow. uh, and step down for the chair for that motion discussion only. That's something I didn't know either. What else have we learned? Anybody? Uh, <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. It really is. Thank you for this chart and things because somebody was a first day okay. responder, 90% of this you'll never use. And so it will get lost very quickly. And it's helpful Still. to have that kind of inline chart. So thank you very much. It'd be in my packet. 
Oh, Lisa, go ahead. Okay. I learned Maybe. that motions to close the meeting should always have a roll call, which we're going to yeah. have to be doing quite a lot because we have, have a lot of closed sessions. So that's good. Good. A good tip. Yeah, that was a good new one. It's good. Uh, I, I'm going to add to that. I, I do try. I do have the intent to try to keep closed sessions short mm -hmm. or more succinct uh, because sometimes there's multiple topics and it will not be succinct, but that will be one of my goals. Who else wants to tell us what we learned, what you learned? I've learned a lot being new to this. Definitely, I learned a lot. Um, I did, um, a lot stuck with me with the conflict of interest because I didn't know you can actually excuse yourself and leave the room. <laughs> that is- you Not only could, you should. Yeah. Oh, you should. If you have a conflict, but that's, since you have an ethics commission, um, I personally think it's a good idea to discuss your conflict because the conflict of interest rules uh, vary depending on what the kind of conflict is, whether it's a contract, whether it's uh, a relative. And people are always surprised that relatives, the list of relatives is pretty short under conflicts. So, um, and how it applies. So definitely would either talk to the ethics commission or is the city attorney full-time? Yeah, well, I mean, contract, but yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess to, to piggyback on that, I think that the, the best practice would be if you perceive yourself to have a conflict would be to reach out to myself and then I can put you in contact with the city attorney and um, get your questions addressed to find out the nature of the conflict if one in fact exists. And, and I say exists because there's a misconception between a financial conflict of interest, which is a true and correct conflict of interest, which you absolutely have to abstain from physically being part of the um, discussion under state law. And if you violate that, there are severe penalties to that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's this kind of nebulous idea of, well, there's a conflict of interest because I live right next door to the, the item that we're discussing about. Oh. That is not a conflict of interest under state law. Um, that is, you know, you as an elected official, part of your job in this, this role is to opine and make decisions on those difficult, sometimes thorny political questions within your own neighborhood. Um, so I just want, didn't want people to leave with the impression that you could just abstain and walk out of the room when there was a tough call that was being made. Yeah. But if there's, as you said, if you have a contract interest in something that we're doing, um, you know, if you worked for our landscaping firm that we're going to hire or you were an architect um, that we were looking at an RFP that you were competing for, those type of things are true conflict of interest where you absolutely have to remove yourself more political questions that you have to, you can vote present, but you, you gotta be here for. Okay, I'm glad you cleared that up because I'm trying, so the conflict is not just with the body, it's with the meeting or anybody in the meeting, if I'm getting this correct. The conflict would be with you, you as an older and your relationship to the item that's being discussed. Okay. So if you had, um, again, a financial relationship with, let, let, let's use the contract as an example, we were going to hire a new garbage collector and you had some sort of financial interest in that firm that was competing for that contract, you could not be present during a discussion, review or vote on which firm we were to select through an RFP process. Okay. If a family member, an immediate family member, or so that would be yourself, your spouse, your, you know, your, your children, um, that would be something that would also be considered a financial conflict of interest. If we're starting to talk about you know, grandparents and cousins, that is not, um, that doesn't fall into that category. Right. And to add to that, you've got actual conflict and then you've got the perception of conflict. So you may decide that even though your first cousin owns the firm you're about to do a million dollar contract with, that's not a conflict under the state law, perhaps, but you may find it's a perceived conflict mm -hmm. that you would feel better not participating. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yes, it was. So that's why it's really important to talk with Brian, talk with the city attorney, understand exactly the nature of the conflict so that you can then make a decision for yourself as to is it actual conflict under state law? Then the rules are very clear, or is it a perceived conflict? Um, 
that is illegal under state law, but you know, may be viewed with you know uh, concern by your voters. Yeah. Sure. On, on the conflict thing, somebody having a conflict and removing themselves from discussion does not preclude us from inquiring on this person or asking them for information and detail as long as we want that information you still can't because then that brings that person back into the conflict so they have many meetings before we say to the person you know you can't state your opinion but you can be asked about the details because they may know something important so yeah no, I, again that, that's why removing yourself physically from the room or the zoom chat whatever the case may be um, this is one of the things that i actually teach on in one of the classes not for cpm but for somebody else um, one of the things we cover is, is that the physical barrier, the physical separation between yourself and the issue that's being discussed um, is, is the best solution. So even the expertise they may have is not off the table. Yep. So. If, if they're an architect, they should not be opining on a RFP that's in front of you. Okay. If they're firm good to know because I've been in many meetings with that's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. different. Were those these city meetings like committee meetings or they've been in committee meetings or things that, you know at the university and other things too where somebody right. has that they're not allowed to be part of the conversation but they may in fact be they're in the middle and they know things that the committee who has to make the decisions need some of that information as, as general information that, that person has and then they remove themselves from the discussion that you also lose that information so that that's yeah it's, that's a struggle. That's when it would happen. Yeah. But that's when you would send, right? So if like RFP, for example, you would need to ask the same questions of all bidders. So if the council had questions on that, then the city would need to go yeah. ask the same question. And that's how you would gain that information yeah. Yeah. from but the person on the inside. Bidders. But it has to be fair to all the bidders. Got it. Anybody else want to talk about <clears throat> David? So then like perceived conflict of interest would be just something more simple, like um, say in my district, uh, um, a friend of mine buys a piece of property, so I'm gonna put a business there. Now it ultimately ends up finance commission or somewhere here where I vote on it. You know, that's just perceived conflict of interest. Everybody knows that person's my friend, I hang out with them, you know, we've known each other but it, there's really no financial. Right, and, and, and the, the advice, and again, I'm not attorney nor am I trying to act like the city attorney in saying this, but uh, the advice that, that I've suggested in, in the past is just disclose that for the record. So if yeah. an item comes up, say, you know, I just want the, the body and the minutes to reflect the fact that Mr. Smith is my neighbor here um, and has this application that's before us. It's not making an impact on my review of this application. Yeah. That's good language. Anybody else? All right. Thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you, to talk Thank you so much for coming in. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on in our agenda. We are going to be much more efficient. Very efficient. Pardon me. Uh, discussion number two, update and discussion on strategic plan priorities. Now, um, hopefully uh, the new alders have had a chance to look at least quickly at the strategic plan. Um, I want to give you a little overview on the difference between the comprehensive plan and the strategic plan. So have you guys seen both of these things? So think of the comprehensive plan as sort of the lofty goals, the, the roadmap, yeah. okay? And it is sort of described in the strategic plan. The comprehensive plan provides the roadmap for land use and physical planning and setting policy and priorities for housing, transportation, and facilities. The strategic plan looks to build on that comprehensive plan, not to replace it. 
takes more detailed look at the city of Middleton's organizational future and allocation of resources. So how I think of this is comprehensive plan, big dreams, big goals, strategic plan, action steps. There are a lot of departments, there are a lot of action steps to reach these goals. And so what the strategic plan has attempted to do, sort of distill it down, organize it in a way that can help the city staff to prioritize what they do, what they focus on every year, what things the council is telling them that we think are the most important for this year so that they can set up their budget in the fall. Um, I'm looking at alders who have been on the council for a while to please correct me if I um, said anything wrong. Um, there are the four core principles in the strategic plan, long-term financial and operational stability, equity-centered environment, communication and engagement, sustainability, and resiliency. So all of that is kept in mind when we set these goals. It's a big elephant and we're gonna take it one bite at a time, okay? So before this new council was um, sworn in, we had a meeting, a committee of the whole meeting, where we came up with our goals, our first set of priorities. And we, um, we just decided on a place to start. So, um, I'm not sure if um, Brian is more interested in having us kind of look at the strategic plan in, as a whole, or if we want to focus in on our first bites. Yeah, and, uh, happy, happy to, to step in and give you kind of some commentary. Um, my, my thought with tonight, um, again, because I want to be mindful of everyone's time, um, you know, had a very good presentation, a lot to think about. So I don't want to spend a ton of time uh, kind of rehashing this, but my goal with having this on the agenda for tonight was to introduce it again uh, to the new members. I know it's, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks, you've had a lot of stuff that you've had to take in um, since you've come here, but wanted to give you a sense of where the previous council kind of set some ideas for what I'd call maybe like a, a work plan uh, for 2023 and, and 2024 using the comp or using the strategic plan um, as a roadmap for that. Uh, and if you've looked at the strategic plan, um, that I kind of put in, in all of your materials when you were um, sworn in, it's a very large document and it's got a, you know, not only does it have the, the larger goals that Council President Nelson mentioned, but it also has about 127 odd um, individual action steps that kind of correspond with those different goals. And the prior council from last year, what, what they didn't want to do is, is a couple of things. They didn't want to have us kind of get overwhelmed by where to start by just saying we have to do all 20, 127 at the same time, which is impossible. But they also didn't want to kind of just rehash what the work we had just done in uh, adopting the strategic plan. So they took some time to prioritize out of that, that list of 127 odd action steps and out of the, the goals that were in the strategic plan, what are the first couple that we want to focus our time and intention on in 2023 and into 2024 um, to, to make some steps and strides on? And so what we did in, in March uh, of this year, just, just prior to you getting sworn in, um, was identify six of those goals in non-ranked order. And those are the, the six that are reflected here on the sheet. And then start to match up some of the individual discrete action steps that tie back into those six larger priorities. And so what you see on this uh, one pager is, is that listing. And so we've got a couple of different larger goals and then the action steps that would make some progress towards that larger goal. And, and as I mentioned that in the brackets, uh, what you see there that the funky looking code, that is more of a reminder to, to staff and myself about where in our spreadsheet does that that goal that, or that action step come from. Um, so TR-3C uh, links back to uh, a spreadsheet that I had sent out to the council that lists all of those action steps from the strategic plan. And that's just a, a way for us to track which ones the council has identified that they want us to work on for 23 and 24. Uh, what I'm doing right now with staff is taking this list of six and having staff spend some time thinking about um, so we've got, you know, kind of initial list of action steps from the council that tie back to these six. Are there additional action steps that make sense to add there? 
um, with keeping in mind that we don't want to overwhelm staff by just plugging in all 127 back into the sheet because that wouldn't provide any value. But keeping a list of probably no more than you know 10, 15, 20 action steps that we think we can make some progress in 23 and 24. Um, so staff is taking a look at that and um, I'll be collecting their feedback on, on that and provide that back to the council. And then the other thing um, that I'm asking staff to take a look at is, so if we move forward with these six uh, goals, what are the metrics that we're measuring our progress against? And the consultant that we worked with to develop this strategic plan had identified a couple of, of measures and some of those may still be workable. Um, some of them may need to be changed to reflect the reality of the type of data um, that we have access to uh, as we're going forward with, with these initiatives. So I will also get uh, staff feedback or department head feedback uh, on that as well and provide that back to the council um, so that you're aware of kind of how, um, what type of metrics we'll use to track our progress. going. So what I was hoping to do tonight is just to introduce this, answer questions that you might have. Um, if you want, I can kind of give you a quick rundown of each of the the action step items here, um, but just to get a sense of if we're tracking in the right direction, and if there are any tweaks that need to be made, by all means, please provide me that feedback and we'll do that. Um, and we can, as we have committed the whole meeting scheduled uh, in the future on kind of more of a regular clip, um, we can continue to check in with this plan. The one thing that I, um, that I will say that I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, in adopting this strategic plan, the prior council really wanted to stress the importance of linking this strategic plan with our budgeting process, because that's where we get the biggest bang for our buck mm -hmm. in terms of policy documents. Um, the strategic plan doesn't mean anything unless it ties into some of the decisions that the council makes. So one of the things that we're gonna do going forward for the 2024 budget process, uh, particularly on the capital um, plan side of, of the discussion, um, for new members, you, you won't know this, but for old council members, uh, for each item that is in the capital budget, each, each item that's in the, Kind of the decision package, if you will, of, of things that we have to weigh against what we can fund in any given year. We have kind of a one page narrative form that kind of lists out what the request is, why we need it, what the cost is, all this sort of information. One of the things that we've added to that um, sheet is a drop down menu that lists out these, these six items and the action steps that go with them so that when staff members are making a uh, funding requests for the capital, they can link it back to an item uh, on this list. So the council can say, oh yes, uh, this purchase that you wanna make of this piece of equipment, that links back to strategic plan item TR-3D. Um, so that as you're making your decisions in the summer, in the fall and into November on the budget, you're getting a sense of how those funding decisions are moving things in the strategic plan for. Mm -hmm. So that's something that'll be coming um, this summer, fall, we get into the meat of the budget process. So um, I wanna pause, answer any questions that you might have on kind of where things sit now and, and take any initial feedback which you might have. So I, as you said, these are not in any particular order. Um, but I do suspect that, you know, there is our competing priorities mm -hmm. to the city. There are things that need to get done. And um, so I would be, you know, like some input on what, what that is. Um, if they, you know, out of this list, if there's anything that jumps out that says, well, you know, this really is important and we need to go after it. Yeah, I, just to to cut, kind of address that, but to clarify a little bit about what Brian was saying too, in my understanding from the last uh, committee, the whole meeting was, these are outside of the normal scope of the work of the city, public safety requirements, the public exactly. works requirements, those things are still, the underlying yep. work of the city yep. is obviously still gonna be addressed. Yep. Whatever. This is just sort of the next layer of what are we going to focus on? What are we gonna be focusing our resources of staff time and mm -hmm. budget beyond the normal day-to-day -day yep. operations? And to that, I mean, I'm, I'm And sure I think that's clear, but I just wanted to, yeah. yeah. No, but, I, but, but still to that point, uh, out of this list, there's, there are, the people who are the closest to it and spend the most time with it because it's their job every single day can say, well, you know, I mean, um, I'm just gonna randomly pick one. We'll say sustainability is good, it's nice, it's important, it's what our future of our planet is, you know, but in order to be more on target right now, we might need to look at something else, you know, that. I, you know, so that's when I say looking for some guidance because um, 
I have my own personal opinions and that's, that's fine, but I'm also want to be pragmatic and very practical about it. So you're thinking like if there's a like from staff, you would like to hear from staff what their focus would be? Or are you thinking just like what other alders are asking? Um, yeah, everybody, because um, we all have, you know, we all, again, we all bring something to the table here. That Go ahead, please, please. Yeah, I, don't know. Yeah, I think where this gets more complicated, like uh, for example, for years I, I chaired parks and we went through the whole process of needing a new $25,000 lawnmower. Mm -hmm. And do we do a battery versus a non? But but the fact that this was on a table and sustainability became a big discussion item in that yep. particular you know committee. And so I think this is these discussions are happening all over the place, and it's hard to find a single focus point. Um, I think this is this is a great idea, and that all the staff know about this, and it certainly came up on that committee as as an issue, and it became a point of discussion. And yes, it was how and the nitty gritty do we balance the fact that right now there's obscenely too expensive and not reliable and so sure yeah yeah and, and, so, and I mean that's, that's not answering your question but it's saying well, it's it, complicated it, 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 but it does answer my question because I mean that's where I trust city staff yeah. okay you know the right thing to do is to have an an, an EV mower mm -hmm. but you know. I also trust their judgment to say, you know, <laughs> this is expensive and this is complicated. And so it, it's just, there's just an impracticality there. So, uh, yeah. 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 And, sorry, just to, to touch on the point a little bit. And so that's one of the things too, as we get into the budget um, cycle, one of the things that we want to provide is the council with as much information possible to make the decisions um, that you need to make. So using the example of uh, an EV piece of equipment, uh, you know, the hope would be that as we get into the capital budget planning process, you know, staff can provide you with, with options. And then if, if, if the, you know, and you can compare um, an EV option to a non-EV option in looking at things like performance and cost and all those different metrics. And then the council with that added information can make the decision on what particular item they want to purchase. And if they decide to purchase the EV option, that, that's great. We just want to make sure you have all the information to do that and knowing that you're doing so in advancing that as a priority that you've identified. Lisa and then Kendra. Um, and on this point, but I have another comment as well. The, um, the sustainable purchasing policy that this council adopted, previous the previous council adopted, specifically says to look at the life cycle cost because sometimes, yes, it might be more expensive now to buy that piece of equipment. Um, but if it doesn't require as much maintenance and doesn't require fuel, we're going to save in the end. Um, one thing I want um, the my newer colleagues to know is that some of these items are done. So the creative communications position, we can cross that one off the list because it's done. Others have uh, dates associated with them. So the stormwater management position, I think we recognize that's a necessary position. We don't have the funding for it, but we could get it through um, uh, our stormwater utility, which in 2024, 20, uh, we need to go to a referendum because our surcharge for the uh, repairs of the conservancy, that's going to expire next year. So this is the, you know, right now we should be talking about how to advance an item like that. Same thing with the civic campus plan. I think our residents are expecting us to make a decision. The pandemic kind of put that on hold. Now we're rethinking, do we build something new or do we renovate what we have? And going back to sustainability, we can't do things like put solar on the library or city hall or the senior center if we're going to get rid of those buildings. So, um, and TID 3 closure is coming up in uh, 2030. So that's something that we need to start thinking about now. So I, I my question to you, Brian, is how, how do you, um, how many priorities can, can we reasonably take on in 2023 and 2024? And who will get the responsibility for following up? Uh, it's a fair question. Uh, I, I would say, you know, some of these items are a little bit easier to get off the ground than others. Um, so I, I wouldn't add too many more action steps to this list um, with the understanding, as Alder Wokus mentioned, of, you know, there's the day-to-day -day stuff that we're also doing. Um, uh, in terms of who would have staff responsibilities, in some cases, it's going to be uh, individual departments uh, who have uh, more kind of touch uh, on those particular items. And in most cases, it's going to be me as the primary uh, person to push the rest of the staff to, to make progress on uh, the items as we can. 
do you need counsel to to make a referral or to direct? For instance, I'm on the Workforce Housing Committee. I would love to see that committee be more active or proactive in trying to figure out what to do with um, the funding that we might have available when we extend, if we extend um, to three by a year. Um, I know we've got a civic campus or a community campus committee, uh, the stormwater utility or, you know, swab, should they be working on the referendum? I mean, does, does council need to direct this to happen or can we just trust that it's happening? Uh, I mean, you can rely on staff. So now that staff has this list, um, they understand in general strokes what the priorities of the council are. Um, I think when it makes sense, I will bring things to the council just to get your your buy-in or, as you mentioned, kind of to refer to another community to get another set of hands uh, to work on something. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I think some of the other things like under financial capital, those are a little bit more difficult to get off the ground because we're one of a number of partners um, that would be involved in those efforts, particularly like the business incubator item. You know, that's going to require one or multiple willing property owners to be involved in that. And we've been having some conversations with some property owners that have an interest in that, but thus far they've not expressed a desire to move forward or have the funding secured or anything like that. So as we continue to move forward with these six priorities and we, we map our progress, some, if you, if you think of it like a stoplight, there will be some that will have greens that we can show definitive progress. There'll be others that will be a little bit mired in yellow because we've done some things, but we're this other item we're not able to make progress on. And there'll be some that'll be in red because for you know, one reason or another, we're not able to make progress on it at this time. Um, so my hope would be, don't quote me, I'm not gonna say like a year from now, but, but over the course of time, I'd like to get to a, kind of a scorecard, if you will, to show the council and the public uh, you know, what our progress on these particular initiatives are. No, I'd like to recommend that we not add any more so that there's a way to have the staff feel the success of completion. Um, Kendra was next oh, and then John. Well, my point from before is has passed, but I, I do want the new alders to have an option to weigh in on what is here though. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I agree that we don't want to add more to the plate of staff, but at the same time, if there is a glaring admission that anyone sees, they should absolutely definitely mention it. John. Yeah, just a, my, my colleague from American District 6 said that, that some of these things are done, some are not done. To me, the, the information that's most important is what's not done and why it's not done. That's more helpful in decision-making process. I presume the city and the staff and everybody buys in and works well and does these things. But just like the discussion with the lawnmower, there were some pretty detailed issues as to why that was not being done. But the citizens were saying, why not? Tell me why not, not why. And so what would be helpful to me to know as a new person here is what is done and what things are not being done. And, and perhaps what most important is why are they not being done or what are the complicating factors so that we look forward, we can begin to explore what might be changed or done differently so that we can help facilitate these things and get them done. Uh, but at the moment, until we know why they're not being done and why they're not happening, it, it's hard to know what how to move forward. So that, that's just the kind of information I would like. Okay. That, that, that's helpful. As we, as staff continues to, you know, again, that they have this list and we're starting to make progress and mm -hmm. thinking about the budget, I think that's helpful for us and we can provide kind of updates, um, yeah. you know, on a more, I don't know what I want to say quarterly, but, but on a regular basis where you can get a sense of, okay, this is where we need to redirect some efforts because this item has not had the same yeah, progress. No, it's not working and this is why. Are you talking about barriers? I'm just clarifying. Just in terms of trying to accomplish all of these goals. Yeah. There, there are reasons sometimes why some of these are slow, sometimes why they're stalled. And it would be helpful from our standpoint to know why they stall so that maybe we can change our way of thinking as the council and redirect priorities or funding, whatever, so that ultimately we can help facilitate getting them done. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey. Just a, just a few questions. My concern is, uh, one of the things is, this list, is it prioritized by the need? Like, sustainability is the first thing. Is that something we're going after? Or is it just set up that way? Is this a list that's just set up that way? Just a list that's set up that way. 
Okay, okay, because I think council know from uh, my speaking at the forums, sustainability is a big concern for me, you know, and that's a priority. And I think that's a TNT today, not tomorrow kind of thing. And like Councilman Schaefer just said, you know, are we doing follow throughs, follow up? What's the blockage? Why can't we get mm -hmm. to where we need to be? I think um, one of the concerns is, and like uh, Council uh, said earlier about, we don't want to put solar panels on the top of the library. And to me, that's wasted capital that we're going to get rid of anyway. And what makes me say that is because I think earlier um, in the airport commission, uh, Maury sets uh one of the, from Maury said something about we got the vehicle for UL, but we don't have the fuel. We got the vehicle, so we got a vehicle sitting out there that we can't get fuel for. Mm -hmm. You know, so I want to just make sure that we're prioritizing and making sure that if if we're putting things in place, that we're definitely moving forward. We're not just putting it in, then it's just sitting there and not serving purpose. Yeah. Um, Brian, can you? Um... <laughs> Sorry, Jennifer, I'm gonna to get to you, but there's a matrix um, that might help you guys. And I don't know if it's gonna be super helpful, but you know, the, the, the action steps that you have for the staff oh, with, the, with the codes. Oh, sure. Um, I can't the find it spreadsheet? on the spreadsheet. Yeah, the spreadsheet. Um, but that might help you guys because there's some metrics and outcomes listed, and then also some um, committees that are involved in these particular priorities and that might help you contact perhaps the chair of the committee and say, where are you on that? Um, and what's the sticking point? Yeah, just to, to give some examples, like um, affordability, for example. So what, what they're talking about is, so we've got, the, the code is more of just an internal notation for myself sure. and staff, so we know what's what. But then if, if you go across, you get the, you know, the department that would be heavily involved in the item. You've got the, the action step itself, the different policy committees from the city that would be involved in the conversation. Um, and then, you know, the, the general timeline and, and the metric that was identified by the consultant, in some cases, that metric is the right metric and, and will remain. In other cases, as we as staff continues to spend time with the plan, we may provide some recommendations on a different metric uh, or different wording for a metric that makes more sense given you know what sort of data we can collect and maintain um, going forward. So that, that's just some commentary. And you anticipate bringing that back to council for approval of that metric, or is that something that as you will just kind of modify as it progresses and then report back? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do whatever the council's preference is. I can bring it back for your your review um, once staff has had some more time to reflect on what those metrics are. Well, and I, most of these are tied with the committee too, so it might be something that can be handled in committee maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know what others are mm -hmm. thinking. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it's just good information, but it's still not giving a why or why not kind of, it's exactly it's setting where, where responsibility, where authority lies and what the process will be, mm -hmm. but it's still not giving us a, information on what, what has or has not and why it does or doesn't. Well, I think those might be tied to more concrete examples. Yeah. Like you're saying, like the purchase of a mower, yeah. you know, that was exactly the process and the why or why not was at the end was it was cost prohibitive yeah. to, to proceed that way. And that might be as we go through the process, mm -hmm. those why or why nots may not maybe become more apparent on a case by case basis. Jennifer, you were next. I think my question has been largely answered, but I appreciate then seeing the spreadsheet because of the mm -hmm. time range and timeline of many things, because if we're going to prioritize some, some things that are multi-year, we need to understand that and have assurance that it will continue on when we do this process again in the following year. Um, because, and then also maybe identifying what really shouldn't be deferred any longer, much like the suggestion about the civic campus plan because it has been deferred for so so much time. Yeah. Um, so we, identifying what's non-deferrable and what needs to appear yeah. in more than one year. Yeah, the spreadsheet can look really daunting, mm -hmm. but um, there are some okay, answers in there that might really like, help you find yeah. your way <clears throat> why some of these priorities were listed as our first our first chunk of them. Well, one of the things I want to say, and I, I piggyback off what uh, Ola Hanaro said, is Brian, 
uh, Madam Mayor, what can we do as a council, those that sit on these commissions to push these agendas when we're having these meetings, like, hey guys, where are we at? You know, what's what's the hold up? Who do we need to talk to? Do we need to talk with Brian? And, and you know, when we meet with Brian, bring back more of, hey Brian, this is the, like, uh, Councilman Schaefer said, these are roadblocks we're running into. So how do we get past these roadblocks? We there needs to be follow-up and there definitely needs to be conversation. Yeah, I, I know. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around um, that question because it is a good question. Because again, we're again we're balancing the need to make progress on these priorities with the day-to-day -day stuff. And so whether it's myself or any individual staff member that's working, if you spend time on one thing, you're not spending time on the mm -hmm. other thing. And so I I hesitate to have the committees push staff members too much um, mm -hmm. so that they can't that's also right. focus on um, their day-to-day -day responsibilities as well. So um, that, that's something I'm gonna have to reflect a little bit more on where the committees can better interplay. I think where it probably works is more of a, like I said, a regular update from the staff member that's working on this particular action step to the committees just to give them a sense of where they're at with it and have that conversation with the committee about any barriers that may exist. And, and quite frankly, I don't want to keep deferring everything to the budget, but a lot for a lot of these items, they will be budget budgetary items that could, could get addressed yeah. through conversations in the budget process. Some of them are not. Some of them are operational. You know, the, the zoning ordinance update is an item that's in process. Uh, Plan commission is taking a look at the draft now. There'll be some additional uh, feedback and, and tweaks to that before it comes to the city council for your review. You know, at some point uh, towards the end of the summer. So it. Each action step that we've already identified here is a little bit different, and they're going to have a different process for how we input in it and measure its progress. Yeah. Not to respond to Alderman Jackson, like, the fact that we are all sitting on these committees behooves us that we have to take these items into those committees because I think all the citizens sitting there, they don't, they're not aware of this. They're not necessarily aware of these priorities. So we we become that point of push on those committees. Right. Um, and Brian's point about everyone has to do their everyday stuff too is it just reiterating that we should keep this to three to five priorities so that um, they actually can happen. Lisa. Lisa. Well, and on that point, I, you know, I totally agree. We shouldn't, you know, I know the staff, I, I was on sustainability. So Kelly Hilliard, she's like the grant go getter and is always working on grants and getting them too. And then she's got to follow through. Mm -hmm. So what we tried to do on sustainability is lighten Kelly's load by taking on some of the things that in a perfect world, we'd have another staff person who could work on. And that's that's what I was thinking for, you know, to use workforce housing. We haven't had a meeting yet, but I'm sure we'll meet in June. Um, I, I would like to ask the staff, how can we, the committee members, help move this item forward? What can we do to lighten your load, You know, not take it away from the staff, but work with the staff and fill in some of the, some of the gaps? I think that makes sense. Very good. And I mean, I commend the, the former council on the fact that, like Brian said, we were it was at 126 that they prioritized and broke it down. Uh, I definitely commend them. I definitely commend the city employees because there's no way they possibly could have structured 126. So I'm glad that they broke it down and prioritized it like this. But, you know, like uh, all the Hanaro said, there's things that are on here that has been in the in the hold. So how do we get out the hole? You know, how do we, what do we need to do? Who do we need to have conversations with? And, you know, we're not trying to do their job, but we're trying to help you do your job. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Kendra, you and I talked about uh, one of the things that, I think it was part of our discussion about the strategic plan and talking about Kelly and her amazing ability to write grants and that she's been bringing these grants to the council every time to get approval for the grants. And one of the things that we'd like to see, that I'd like to see that um, Alder Wolkus would like to see is that once something is approved, that she, for example, Kelly, doesn't have to keep coming back to the council to ask for permission to write this next grant because there are some that are really time constrained and she's just amazing at it. We just don't wanna 
get in the way and have just another bureaucratic step. Yeah, and I think that point is um, well taken. And, and it, it's not to say that we don't want the council to weigh in on the grants. I think it's a question of sometimes, I'm just thinking some of the ones Kelly's been working on in the last month, um, they sometimes get four, maybe six weeks tops of notice mm -hmm. of when mm -hmm. grant opens to when grant closes and your application has to be in. Uh, and so if, and again, I'm not asking you to vote on anything tonight, but just something food for thought. Um, you know, if the council, generally speaking, was supportive of, if it is you know, going back to our list of six things, if it was a sustainability related item, does staff have your blessing to apply for a grant? And if it requires a financial match, that if we were notified that we were going to receive the grant, then the council would have to obviously sign in and um, you know say, yes, we, we agree to whatever the match is, but at least would allow Kelly and others to get the grant applications in so we're in the hopper and we could figure out um, if we were successful, how we would deal with that on the back end. Totally reasonable. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, from my personal opinion, you're also the liaison person to the council, to the staff, and they should be coming to you before they come to us, but we should trust you and they should trust you that you're here at these meetings. You hear, you understand what we're thinking and, and you can be a buffer in that way, it should be. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree with that. I, I, I would, if we needed to vote on that tonight, Brian, I would have no problem with that because that's what we just asked. What could we do to help? That's one of the ways we can help. If that's what helps to push it forward, then we can go ahead and push it forward. Because one of the things is, is everything that's on this list, and I, and I briefly uh, went through it, it, it affects each one of our districts and affects the city as a whole. And I think we were elected to move the city forward. So we got to help to move the city forward. And if the, the if they're saying that the tie up is they got to keep coming back to us, we'll make Brian the middleman. We trust them. OK, Brian, if you say it's a go, it's a go. And we fine with that because we want this done. We all agreeing that this is what we want done. So let's get it done. And perhaps um, that's the recommendation. I mean, that's kind of what this committee of the whole is. Think of it as a regular committee that makes recommendations to the council. So. That could be our recommendation to the council. Do do we as a committee of the whole do motions in this? We don't, we nothing. No, it's, it's more of a workshop. Okay, so we would yeah. say that, so you would put it on a, an agenda item as like on a committee, on a council agenda as. I'd, I'd probably put something on the 20th would be my guess. Yeah. But if I may, can we go back to that to that list of six? But I like that term, the list of six. And just for the interest of time and for clarity, can we just, as Alder Hainaira pointed out, there's a few things on here like create communications position. It's already been created and filled. So do we need to augment that one to say, I don't know, um, facilitate that position? I don't know if that is completed can we check that off do we need to augment that to i would just mark it action complete okay yeah to know the yeah. status of most of these yeah. 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 And, yeah and since you're in yeah and since you're in june of the year yeah. we should be one or two done for the year so i think that's a good point alder wilkes that's to say it's done um, my other question would be, um, just to clarify this a little bit more, and I'm just going to take the lead and I would hope that everyone would weigh in if there's anything else that they want to have tightened up, but the implementation of new technology, I looked it up in the strategic plan and it's really vague, develop comprehensive technology plan for all city operations. So I, I'm not, I don't remember quite how that ended up on our list from before, but I think that needs a little. Yeah, I, I think that was an item um, expressed by uh, the former mayor. Um, again, not so much from the way that was phrased in the strategic plan, but from the idea of um, with new technologies, with artificial intelligence, there may be ways to streamline operations. Uh, you know, and we've done this over the last couple of months, you've seen um, the express bill pay as one example. That was the purchase okay. of a new software. So Got it, allowed. okay the city to be more efficient in our um, service to customers um, by having that system, which integrates with our other financial system so we can be better, quicker respond to people. Uh, and so I think that was the intent with that one is that as there are technologies that come across um, our desk that, that makes sense for the city, um, 
that we would bring that forward uh, to the Finance Committee and Council to consider if we thought it was something that could improve efficiency. Um, on the AI front, uh, we've had some initial use of like uh, chat GPT. Um, it has a lot of possibilities. It has some things that, that give uh, some folks some pause. Um, so we'll continue to explore those type of technologies as they improve and there may be ways for us to incorporate that. I will have to say, if anybody saw public safety or the, the police department's um, Facebook post about the chicken, chat GPT could not write that Facebook post. You should go and look, it's very cleverly written. It's very punny. <laughs> it is very, I just, saw it today and I had to give him a shout out because it was really cute. But um, I'm wondering if that implementation of new technology should be under communications and not social cap. I'm just, I guess maybe where it's falling kind of confused too. I don't know if anybody else agrees with that or not, but. May I, I just wanted to point out, I, I totally agree. And I think this is one of the um, shortcomings of the, just the length of the plan, but goal six, actually, I think, phrases it better to say, use technology to improve efficiency and cost effectiveness of city services. That's a goal that's easy to get behind. Um, there is only one action under this goal, and that's the TR6A that we're discussing, develop comprehensive technology plan for all city operations. So that's a really specific action that I could see taking a long time, a lot of money if we have a consultant do it, mm -hmm. whereas the loftier goal of using technology to improve efficiency and cost effectiveness of city services, that's what you, you know, we've had things brought to us that will do that. So I, yeah, point. maybe, maybe we roll it up to the goal itself and not focus so much on the, the specific that. action that the um, consultant came up with. I would agree with that because I think then that aids in the city staff's measurement and reporting back to us of it, because rather than like the sort of vagueness of implementation of new technology as a whole, when you go back up to the original goal, you're going to be able to say, well, here's what we did to achieve that. And so it may be, it makes it a little sm a smarter of a smart goal. So I, I, I could weigh in on the technology front just a little bit. Um, there's really uh, two ways to look at technology. You know, one is it's just an infrastructure product. So um, whatever technology the city's using for, you know, cloud services and all of its infrastructure as it ages out and and it and technology has a high, you know, defined age structure to it. So, you know, that's where replacement and impl implementation of, of newer technology is put in place. The other side of really new technology side is the innovation side of it. And so there's just two straight pieces of it and how you want to spend money. And so innovation can be social media and outreach, you know, what do you do with a website and how do you make it accessible and how do you make it engaging? You know, there's, there's just that whole world. And then there's the other side of technology, um, which really is just the inner communication of the city. So, you know, the, the city could could start, you know, uh, leveraging communication groups and teams-based product, products for a lot of internal leverage communication, a lot of project management, and a lot of, you know, tools and resources like that, which, um, for example, defining about licensing levels with like, you know, the city already is embedded with Microsoft Office 365, how much you want to pay for, you can, you can really scale it out and, and have um, highly integrated, uh, sophisticated products. So um, that that may also help a little bit that, you know, there's just a, a black and white infrastructure side of technology. Um, as it ages, you replace it with, with simply newer modern products that bring efficiency to the city. Now, if we want to be leading, bleeding edge, and, you know, and we're talking about chat and, and open AI and that type of thing, that I, I think that's separate. Um, the department I, I manage, it's infrastructure, IT is pretty much about the same size as the city. So, you know, and that's kind of how we take it. We just, we run the infrastructure side of it, ages out, you replace it, you do what's cost effective and kind of follow the trends out there as well. Trends aren't always good, but they're there. <laughs> and then of course, the bleeding edge side of it. So that's just kind of my two cents. Jennifer. I have not really not related to that, but another question about how 
we, we are managing this list and reaching these. Um, so as things fall off, are you looking to, right? So I'm thinking specifically communications, right? Check, done, communications, position. So then does that bump up, prepare and distribute monthly news summaries? What other communications goals like could be added? I mean. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a fair question. I, again, I don't know that. Um... Is it, it's a specific to communications. We this person started two weeks ago, so I want to give them some run. Sure, sure. Figure out what's, it's what's just going a, it was on. just an example. Um, of, yeah. But yeah, but that, that's a good example. And I think again, as we have more regular check-ins on this topic, I think you know, as as the council sees progress on a particular item, if you feel like it has been accomplished, then I think you can give guidance back to staff that yep. That item has been done it can be removed from the list and i'd like to substitute okay this other i, I think that again kind of a rolling yeah. mm -hmm. from my standpoint i think we go on all night talking about this but until we know what's done and what's not done and sort of we, we've seen that we've been shown this that we sort of really need the status on all of this stuff and then and then i think we can be more efficient in our conversation i just want to add um a don't know if I agree with the rolling add on. I feel like this is our plan for 23 24. Right. Then we make another one. Okay. I agree. I, I like the mayor's point that we take the win. You know, we can say mission accomplished. Yeah. And then, and then look ahead to the next step next year. Yeah. So if if I may just go back to the conversation we're having about new technology, do we want to augment that one then at all? Or do we want to just leave it as it is and see how it rolls? Do I'm okay. I like the idea of going back to just saying it as goal six, the use of technology to prove efficiency and cost effectiveness. I feel like that's tighter. Um, so I agree with Alder Hanairo's suggestion to do that. Yeah, um, I think I just I would change that 3B that's listed right there to, to goal just number six. Goal six. And then Go for that. Yeah. Great. I don't know that I want to move to communications because that they, that person wouldn't really have involvement in that piece necessarily. So I, I think under number five B, though, that's a little constrained. And if you got a new person, you might want to, you know, talking about monthly news summaries, that's great. But there's many other things that might come forward to that seems like it. Yeah. And, uh, that's more of a, um, a to do I guess those. I call it a developmental goal for that that yeah. the individual that we've hired. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once they've been on the job for a little bit and get a sense of what our communication channels are and where to best get information out, um, then I think we can develop a, a e newsletter. Okay, mm -hmm. but that might be a you know end of well, twenty three type of thing. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the feedback. Um, I'll continue to to muddle through this with staff um, and that your point is well taken. Well, the Schaefer about kind of getting a snapshot of where we're at on certain items. Uh, again, the disclosure disclaimer I'll give now and I'll give when we talk about this again is that, you know, because this list was adopted at you know, the end of March, there'll be some items that we will be in red and there'll be some items that'll be in green and there'll be some items in yellow, but I think that will invite a conversation about, okay, if we know that, um, then where, where are some things that we need to change or what barriers do we need to, to hop over? One thing I would point out with that is because I don't want you to feel like you can't weigh in on these because you don't know. No. So I want to make sure that if we're providing more information in what, two months? Something like that. Something like that. Again, not wanting to have this as a rolling okay. document, you know, saying we decide when, when thinking to the future, when do we set the strategic plan? For the next year like are we thinking that this committee of the whole meeting happens again in january with the the beginning i'm, I'm just wondering what the ideas of the council would have about how we do set the next term if we're not going to be rolling I, at least my understanding from our conversation in march and then prior to that was that this list that's in front of you tonight would serve as our plan for the remainder of 23 and then the remainder of 24. 24. Okay. okay. Um, so then we would start this conversation again about what are the priorities for 25 and we'll call it the middle of 24. Okay. And that was intentional because yeah. since this plan was new for all of us, uh, we've never been through a budget cycle with it yet. We wanted to give ourselves a little bit longer runway to make progress on these items um, since we haven't done this for, yeah. I don't even know if we've had a strategic plan. No, so I don't well, but, and I guess that's another question is then does this seem like enough to get us through to 25? 
Well, I think this does with more clarification and information about it. I mean, that's my whole point is this a set in place and I'm not trying to undo what's been set for the next two years, but if we're looking at what goes on after that, I have to know what's failing and not working here. And that's that's why I'm we're just struggling to get more information on where we are. Not to, not to twist this and knot it up, but just to, so that I can understand what's working and not working. And then a year from now, we look at the next one and we got a better sense. I do anyways. I, I think outside of this one. My apologies. I, I think this is a plenty long list. <laughs> I really do. I mean, because the stormwater management, mm -hmm. civic campus plan, and TID 3 closure, yeah. not to mention the new zoning ordinance, which is still months of review. It yeah. is a lot. Right. Yeah. And, and like I said, some of the items like, um, you know, volunteer promotion, for example, that that's an item where we, we typically have not been involved in that effort. So starting something from mm -hmm. probably close to ground zero will take some time. So I, I tend to agree. Um, that this list seems sufficient for the next, we'll call it 18 months. Um, and if, 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 look, we've got greens on everything. So I think that, that then deserves a conversation about are those things we need to add before sure. we get to 25. If, if we're lucky. Yeah, since somebody's referred to you as the old guys, that must mean I'm the young guys. Yeah. <laughs> Randall. And I have I was, to, I have I to was gonna, trust that you guys knew what you were doing when you put this together. I was going to point out too, I mean, as we do check things off, it's not like city staff is going to run out of things to do and be <laughs> sitting there twiddling their thumbs. So I don't, I don't think we need to necessarily add sure. to this. They're good. Um, as, as things get checked off. They're good, but we don't want to burn them out. Right. Lisa, um, one last point about timing for developing the 2025 list. That should happen. We should have a good sense of what we think 25 and 26 will have um, when we're preparing the budget a year from now for 2025. Yep. Otherwise, we've missed our chance. So that's just. Yeah. So think about. thinking about that. When does that committee the whole meeting or when do we do the next priority to list? How do you guys feel about that? Oh, here our honorable mayor has made a suggestion. Not close. So start thinking about July, August in this year to talk about 25? You could, or you could start over here. And then, um, but we really need to go to training school. Yeah. Next yeah. Out, but I think you should have it here. May I throw out the suggestion that yeah. we do it in March, just like we did? I mean, that's what happened in this year. We came, I mean, this year we came up with the plan yeah. for this year, which is not optimal. Um, but it certainly, you know, we could do this again in March to come up with a new prioritization that'll give the staff plenty of time to weigh in and have us finalize it during the budget process, which we could kick off in June or July. And the, the younger council members will have time to get if, if we do, um, if we have a cow in the fall, like November, then the staff can have January 1st as like a launch pad too. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can keep it open as to when our next discussion on this would be. I'm happy to take any suggestions. Can I ask if if this if this cow was helpful, especially for the newer folks? I'm, we're saying that because there was feedback, and I, I'm sure you heard that as well as president uh, of the folks who came in last year that they didn't feel they got a lot of training. I, I mean, you kind of do learn as you go. That's what the president and I experienced um, when I came in. I sat with the city administrator a few times and I read the Roberts rules books. It is very dry. It was my, my time reading. I went right to yeah. sleep. It was awesome, but it did take me like three months and he lent yeah. it to me, but it's a training like tonight's training. And then the strategic plan, is that helpful to you guys as newer members? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah of course. Tomorrow's going to help a lot too. You're uh, I call it Alder School. Um, that's a really good day spent. That's a really nice program. 
I would even say that what we were at last night was yeah. very DCC. very absorbing, yeah. very yeah. helpful. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 The DCCBA. And good yeah. for you, good for you yeah. for taking the time to do it. Yeah. You know. And, and may I point out that I'm sure Middleton was the best represented oh, yeah. municipality oh, yeah. there. It, we yeah. were in the building. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. For, for sure. Oh, <laughs> that is wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. Okay. Do you think it would be helpful to have another training in the next six months topic wise? Because um, the president can think about topics, but I'm trying to figure out for the timeline of the rest of the year. Is there anything that you feel necessary? Funny you should ask. I um, had a nice meeting with the vice president and we talked about a couple of different ideas for topics for cows. And one of them is how is agenda, how is an agenda put together? What's the difference between a resolution and a proclamation and all of that stuff? Who gets to add to an agenda? And how does that process happen? And I think that would be a really good committee the whole meeting. I would like to hear those answers. <laughs> if I would suggest something that I would appreciate it's on as budget time comes around, is having a workshop on the whole process of how a budget's put together. That's a wonderful that idea. Out, Great idea. That's the most important thing. And that's the thing. If we haven't been on a budget committee, we just, that, that could be very helpful to me. Yeah, and we, we do um, typically have that exact committee the whole um, yeah after the summer before we get into the, the yeah, meat okay. of the fall so that we kind of explain where we're at from a financial picture, what are the different, um, you know, for example, revenue sources that are coming in from the state and elsewhere that uh, influence how we make decisions. Um, uh, Bill Burns, our finance director, gives a really good presentation on kind of setting the stage for the discussion that comes in the fall. Bill Burns is an amazing resource. Yeah. And he's really good at explaining things. So don't be afraid to ask him questions. I'm very generous at this time. Very. So. And just so you know, I did send testimony in. Uh, if I allowed Brian to share that. I don't know if I've seen that. It's off topic. Um, I'll send it to the council. Okay, thanks. There'll be an email. Pardon? There'll be an email. Okay. Um, is there anything else on the strategic plan that we need to talk about? Uh, I want to get back to the fact that uh, what Brian had suggested earlier, I like Brian, I trust Brian, um, that we vote on untying their hands when it comes down to the grants and letting Brian be uh, our middle person. We say we want to move things forward. He knows what's going on. He's really interacting with them. And I think we should give him that leeway Absolutely. so that we get things. Does moving. that need to be an agenda item? It does. Um, okay. I don't know that I can add it for Tuesday's meeting because that agenda is pretty well locked up um, and okay. getting ready to post, but I can add it for I, the 20. I would support that. Yeah. yeah I think and I'm would. assuming it's going to have to be on finance too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I'm thinking that the 20th would be the best bet for that one. Great, Lisa. Um, along those same lines, I trust Brian and I would like to. Um, I would like to see council encourage Brian to make full use of our ordinance um, as it relates to the consent agenda. Um, I've noted in the past that many of the items on the council agenda, well, okay, so I'm on finance, I've been chair for the last year, and I love it because when I'm done preparing for finance, I'm like 80 to 90% ready for the council <laughs> meeting because everything shows up there. And it seems that especially the items that come to the finance committee from another committee, if they have been approved without any dissent and finance does the same, which we almost always do, it seems those items could make their way into the consent agenda and save us the and save staff from having to record four or five different votes on resolutions. So I, I would like to see us discuss this and formalize some sort of policy the next time I know the previous mayor felt it was very important that anything that had to do with money, council should always vote on. The point is we do vote on it. It's just in the consent agenda and any member can pull an item off for discussion. So I think the base that base is covered. Can I add my appreciation of that? Because the last meeting had 26 agenda items mm. and uh, yes, efficiencies is applauded, so. 
Speaking of that, I got a chicken dinner waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I'm from the hungry. post. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I will make a mo Oh, sorry. Go ahead. A any other questions? Oh. I'll make a motion. We adjourn. <laughs> I'll second that motion. <laughs> All right. Any discussion? We don't need discussion. Yeah. That's right. another thing I oh, learned. Oh, that's right. I yeah. learned. You can <laughs> on the motion to adjourn. You just go straight to the vote, which yeah. will save us. All in favor of adjourn, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Move